Well, thanks, Dave, for that, uh, for that introduction and for inviting me to moderate this morning's panel. Um, I'm really quite honored. I mean, you had your choice of, uh, of many former Harper Communications directors. <laughs> so, so, so many. Uh, anyway, the, uh, the topic that our journalist panel will be discussing for the next hour is how the conservative movement ought to recharge. Ah, the hand wringing. Boy, that takes me back. Though it was really much easier in the 1990s. Hey, eh, Chuck? You know, stalled at the Manitoba Ontario border, start a new party. Those pesky PCs just won't die, start a new party. The breakfast buffet ran out of bacon, start a new party. It's a tiny bit more complicated uh, this time, which is why I'm looking forward to what our panelists have to say this morning. Uh, with us, we've got Mercedes Stevenson, Anthony Fury, Chantal Hebert, and Paul Wells. See, it, it's changed times. We applaud for journalists now. Sunny ways, <laughs> sunny ways. So Mercedes is the parliamentary reporter for CTV News Channel and the Friday host of Power Play. She joined CTV's Parliamentary Bureau in 2011 and has covered major stories all over the globe, including the Boston bombing, the crisis in Ukraine, and the Canadian military training in Niger. Anthony, uh, next to her, is the aptly named Anthony Fury, which really, when I think about it, is the perfect uh, handle for an opinion writer. Anthony is the national columnist for the Sun Media chain of newspapers. He's also written for Time, uh, New York Daily News, Human Events, and more. He's been a guest on Fox News Channel, BBC, and can regularly be heard on talk radio. Chantal Hebert is the Toronto Star's national affairs uh, writer and political columnist. She's been giving politicians sleepless nights since uh, really her days at Queen's Park in the late 70s, covering the minority governments of uh, progressive conservative premier uh, Bill Davis. Chantal is a regular member of the CBC's Ad Issue panel, an award-winning journalist, and a member of the Order of Canada. Last but not least, Paul Wells. Paul is the political editor of Maclean's magazine. In more than two decades on the Hill, he's covered seven federal elections and four prime ministers. He's won three Golden National, uh, Gold National ma uh, Magazine Awards and a National Newspaper Award. Uh, he's written two books on Stephen Harper, which I'm really sure he'd like you to, uh, to buy if you don't already own them. Uh, the second one, uh, the longer I'm Prime Minister, was the winner of the $25,000 Shaughnessy Cohen Prize for political writing. So the way uh, things are going to work, each of our guests will have about five minutes to give their thoughts uh, on our theme this morning. Then I'm going to ask a couple of questions to warm them up, and then you have at them. So without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Mercedes to take the podium and tell us whether we have to recharge, uh, rethink, or maybe simply relax. So, Mercedes. Thanks very much, Jim. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here today, especially on this panel, and I'm glad I'm first, because if I had to go after the other much more eminent journalists, <laughs> this would be harder to do. So I'm going to give you uh, my perspective as a reporter, which is really all that I can give you. I interact daily with people on the Hill who are in politics, trying to get information. I covered the election uh, very closely, watched how that unfolded. Uh, and I think there's three main points that I would make, and they all have to do with communication, because only the conservative movement as a movement can figure out what you're going to be about, how you're going to go about doing that, uh, what you're going to offer to voters as an alternative that the other parties don't have. That's one thing that I don't think was particularly clear in this election. But this will mostly deal with how you get that message out about who you are, because the people in this room are all great people, but you can't win an election with just the people in the room. You can't govern uh, provincially, federally, any other way. Any party has to be able to move beyond their base or they don't get elected. The first point that I would say is issue management. That's not how you communicate. Issue management uh, is something that became quite dominant inside the Harper government. Um, I call people every day to try to get answers to questions. I don't expect that political staffers are necessarily going to want to talk to me uh, or that they're going to give me something, but the story will happen anyhow. And an issues management approach can interfere uh, significantly with the ability to have strategic communication 
with the ability to get what your message out is and to have a coherent strategy. Because the problem with issue management is that you jump around day to day and you defeat each story, uh, as the mindset were, uh, in that particular news cycle. But in the long term, it can come back to bite you. And it can generate ideas that are not necessarily inspired, but are reactive. Uh, and that's something that I think every party has to think about because there's a tendency in the 24-7 news cycle to be focused very immediately, not only by politicians and political staff and people in the movements uh, on all sides of the spectrum, but also for reporters. So to really find a way uh, to try to tell the story that you're telling, not just to deal with today's crisis and make it go away, because three weeks from now or three months from now, that crisis might be much worse for you based on what was said if it was just said in the moment to try to fix it. Band-aid approaches are not great when it comes to communication strategies. Um, training people to communicate. There was a lot of really young, interesting people in the room last night, in the room today. The next generation, whether it be conservative, liberal, or NDP, the conservative movement in particular seems to have a lot of people who have been in communications but don't necessarily know what that means. Uh, and if the strategy of communications is to stifle or stop communication, that's a real problem when you're in opposition. Because when you're the government, you get media because you're the government. When you're in opposition, that's not the case. And so finding lines or stonewalling is not something that's going to work, and I, I'm not sure that it was particularly successful in government either. So you have all of these young, bright people in this movement who have great ideas. The ability to put people out there and to let that next generation uh, take the stage and think about how they're going to do things and take a refreshed approach, I think is something that could bring a, a lot of interesting ideas to your movement and a lot of interesting stories that get out there and communicate to people about who you are and what it is that you are trying to do. Um, the persecution complex. I came across this a lot, uh, and it still exists. And what I would often hear from people who were in their 20s was that under reform, the press gallery wasn't fair to them. They might have been in elementary school under reform. Um, so there's almost a generational inherited complex about who the media are, that the media are the enemy. Uh, look, we're not your friend. We're not here to make you look good. We're not here to tell the story that you want told. We're here to tell the stories that are unbiased, that are straightforward. But this idea uh, that the media is somehow the enemy and therefore you cut them off, you don't talk to them, you're hostile towards them. Staffers run away from media uh, in you know, the various watering holes of Ottawa where you've got other parties reaching out, communicating and connecting to people, establishing relationships. Here's the problem. If a journalist runs a story and there's something that's not quite right in it, it's a little bit off, uh, on a very tight deadline, and a phone call comes in from somebody who they've really never heard of or heard from, and that person is very aggressive with them, insisting that they've been spun, that their story is wrong and they need to change it. How likely do you think the journalist is to believe that person versus to think they're trying to spin them? There's been some kind of pre-existing relationship and communication there, uh, and there were certainly people in the conservative movement who had that kind of credibility that if they called, people would listen and say, you know, let me take a second look. Maybe that wasn't quite what I thought it was. Maybe I'll take a second look and see if there's another story here. But without any kind of a pre-existing relationship uh, or, or sense that you know who people are and can talk to them, that's not a possibility. So I'll keep it short and sweet at that, but uh, that's my big message is figure out what you're gonna communicate, which only you can do, but figure out how you're going to communicate it not from a place of uh, building up the armaments and defenses and putting a moat around your castle, but from figuring out what you actually want to put out there and being willing to explain the ideas. Because people are smarter than you think. And the idea that you cannot explain a strategy, that you cannot explain a story, that you just need to make it go away, is something that doesn't really tell Canadians what you're about. It tells them more what you don't want to talk about. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks very much for, for having me, Jim, and it's a great treat to be here alongside some uh, fellow journalists who have uh, much, uh, much more impressive experience than I do, so it's a real honor to, uh, to be here with them. And uh, I, wanna, I think I want to build upon Mercedes' remarks, because I completely agree with them, and I just have one little point to make, but I think it's a vital point, and that's pointing out what I think was a major deficit 
in this recent campaign, and even really throughout the past 10 years, which is the importance and the power of positive storytelling. Now, I've been really reluctant in my writing and commentary to jump on this bandwagon about tone. Harper's tone, conservative tone, I just find it a little bit too much. And I think a lot of it is also the left trying to frame the debate in their favor when they say tone. Because I think what they mean by it is, there's a lot that the conservatives were doing that was mean and nasty. But they just think conservatives are mean and nasty in general. So they're trying to get you to go and just be more like them, concede territory. So I found that whole conversation a little cheesy, but I can't help acknowledge that there's this, there's this major grain of truth to it, but in a way that I think the right to recharge needs to repurpose it and, and make it their own. And what do I mean by this? I look back to, for instance, all throughout the past 10 years, there were many, many things that I believe the Prime Minister, the previous Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, was right about. But you sort of had to come to that conclusion yourself. You had to intuit it, and you had to understand by yourself that that was the case. I don't think the party did a great job of saying to folks, here, I'm going to take your hand and let's go on this journey together. And I'm going to work with you and, and help you understand and come and go the distance to where you are to encourage you to come along on my ideas. I don't think we really saw that much at all because there was a lack, like I said, of positive storytelling. What do I mean by that? Probably if you're here in this room, you believe that all these policies you're advocating for are good policies. They're good news stories. So you've got this guy like, you know, remember when Jack Layton ran in 2011 and he was just, he just had this ear to ear grin and he was so excited to go across the country and tell people all these great ideas he had because he thought it would make their lives better. And he just couldn't stop talking about them and he couldn't stop smiling because he thought they were so powerful, wonderful, positive ideas. And Canadians got that. And I think that's one of the reasons that the NDP did so well in 2011 because it is just strong, unrelenting, positive message. And I think that by and large, conservatives really failed to deliver a message like that all across the past 10 years. And that, that key point I want to make is that if you truly believe that what you're saying is the good path forward, the positive path forward, that it's a way to make people's lives better, oh, I know these folks on the left, they're saying they're going to end poverty, but guess what? I've actually got this, I want to end poverty too, and I've got better ideas to do it. And you can't make me stop smiling about it, and you can't make me stop talking about it because I'm so passionate about it. And we're not getting that right now from conservatives. As a, as a media critic myself, or just the average folks I talk to at parties and family events who are apolitical, who are that middle that you're going to be chasing, they don't feel that. They don't feel that they're being taken by the hand and encouraged to go along on that trip because there's a positive message that's going to make their lives better. And I think that, that recharge, that tweak, that reboot, should probably be an integral part of the next few years forward. That's it. Well, as the senior citizen on this panel, I just want to point out that it's not only young aides who weren't born when the reform was on the Hill, a number of reporters were also in elementary school. So uh, maybe take that into account before saying you were hostile to Preston Manning. Me in grade two. God. Um, I just want to add about relationships. That when I do these things for journalism students and they ask, how do you cultivate sources? And I think it's a two way street. I say, well, actually, the best way to cultivate a source is to talk to people when there's not a crisis and talk to them about other things than what you do and what they do for a living, where they went on holidays, uh, et cetera. Uh, for two reasons, they're more likely to call you back if they are in a crisis and you need to talk to them. And also, if you do talk to them and establish a relationship, you're going to know when they're lying to you. So just so you know <laughs> how these are. I, mean, I, too, have three points that I will touch on really briefly. Uh, they deal less with communications and, and a bit more with policy and body language. Uh, the first is you may have noticed that the, your party looks really comfortable in opposition. Sometimes uh, your MPs look happier in opposition than they did in government. 
that's probably good news that they're so good at opposition, but I think you should reflect on the fact that maybe in government, the conservatives never stopped acting like an opposition party, and that goes to Anthony's point, uh, that it always seemed more important to go on the attack against other parties or other ideas uh, than to actually put forward or defend conservative ideas uh, with positive arguments. Uh, so it's great to have, you know, uh, the knack to be in opposition, but it is a mentality that was not lost. Uh, it's quite amazing that over a decade, it actually became a more entrenched, this opposition uh, mentality. The shiny bright objects on the other side of the aisle always seem more interesting uh, than the shiny bright objects that the conservatives could have put forward and that ended up buried in omnibus bills or... Uh, not accessible or, or explained properly. My second point is on demographics, and, and that first point leads to when you look back on what has happened, uh, the campaign and how the right comes back, you might want to spend more time looking at how that decade evolved than how the last campaign evolved. But if you're going to look at the last campaign, I suggest you pay more attention to the voters you missed and to the voters you got. Uh, almost 3 million new voters this year. Many of them were young people. They're not going to go away. If you look at Bernie Sanders in the U.S., a number of the people who are behind him are the young people who signed up for Barack Obama. When you vote once, you do come back. And they will change the political discourse, and you haven't been really talking to them. And one of my favorite points I saw so many stories that bragged about how the conservatives did not want this single professional woman who lives in a city. Well, if you le read the New York Magazine this week, you will find a cover story that tells you that uh, single women are now the most potent political force in America. They make up more than 50% of voters, and traditionally they are more inclined to issues such as childcare, family balance policies, issues that I've been uh, identified to a progressive agenda. If you don't want to talk to them, you will be taking yourself out of the game. And finally, on so many of these issues that are of interest to this significant contingent of new voters and these single women, it's not that you have bad policies, it's that you don't have any. You're simply not competitive on any of those issues. And unless you want to start thinking about them, you are giving the progressive side of the political spectrum a huge gift. Thank you. I, I forgot what I was gonna say. Uh, I want to begin with a caveat. Uh, 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 don't listen to anything I say. Father Raymond D'Souza is here, and it's always good to see him. And he reminds me that when I was here last year, I had just written a column in which I announced that Justin Trudeau had peaked and that it was all downhill from there. <laughs> so, whatever. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I've, I've been enjoying the, uh, the months since October 19th because I uh, work at 130 Albert, uh, which is the same building as the Conservative uh, Party headquarters. And since October 19th, the young conservative staffers that I meet in the, in the, in the elevator feel free to talk to me. Uh, it used to be like, just surreal things. John Geddes and I would be riding down in the elevator, and there'd be this person uh, leaning further and further into her, uh, uh, her phone. And, and we'd get a block out the door, and I'd say, I think that was Jenny Byrne. And, and, and I'd Google. I'd sit there in the World Exchange Googling her picture, and yeah, that's Jenny Byrne. I guess she dyed her hair. Um, but um, anyway, now people just say hi, and we, how are you doing? And it's very relaxed. And I think it's closer to what the Conservative Party was uh, uh, much more recently than a decade ago. Uh, it was actually what the Conservative Party was like when it was succeeding under Stephen Harper. So much of the party's success and uh, failure over the last decade is bound up in the personality of that man that um, uh, it's going to take, uh, just inevitably and in the natural course of things, a, a long time for the conservative movement to decide what's it wants to be, what it wants to be when it grows up. Um, in, in France, this is one of my favorite political analogies and, 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 and no one ever picks it up because it's so incredibly geeky. Uh, in France, Charles de Gaulle, after the war, wrote a constitution for a new French government with a strong president. 
And it was so obviously written so that Charles de Gaulle would become the president, which he did. And then the question among people who watch politics was, can Gaullism survive de Gaulle? And then he uh, lost, uh, re resigned and died, and, and, and a new leader of his party was able to uh, take over, and, uh, and the answer was yes, it, it could. And then the question was, can Gaullism survive the Gaullists? Uh, could a socialist govern under the system that this center-right leader had, uh, had um, developed? And Mitterrand became the president, and France had good days and bad days, but the answer was yes. I mean, the, the question now is, can Harperism survive Harper? But I think it's important to remember uh, some of the important things that he, that he contributed. At his best, when the party was gaining uh, in seats and popular vote in election after election, the Conservative Party was comfortable. It was comfortable with itself. It was comfortable with all Canadian conservatives, including progressive conservatives who had been strong uh, uh, um, uh, contributors to the Mulroney uh, Progressive Conservative Party, including um, prairie populist conservatives who are, you know, maybe not super comfortable at the Rideau Club, but have ideas and energy and and uh, and help build the Reform Party, and are not done yet, uh, and uh, you know. Uh, um, it was often fun to get to know everyone who was working around Jason Kenney because you, you would have uh, uh, strong Zionist uh, Jewish staffers who were really proud that the party was standing up for Israel. You would have uh, uh, gay libertarians. You would have uh, a, a, an Iranian immigrant communications director who had run for the Canadian Alliance when he was 20 years old and was, and, and was really happy about the stances the party was taking around the, the world. And, uh, and, again, and on and on and on, you'd have people who wanted to be Dick Cheney when they grew up, and they were all happy working together, because on, on, on some days, they, each of them had a, um, uh, uh, a position that the party was taking that they thought they could support. It was a strong contrast from the days of the Clark and Mulroney conservative parties, when people who called themselves conservatives at home and to their friends often felt that the party was ashamed of them. And I don't think that the Conservative Party should leave behind the sense that all Conservatives can now feel comfortable in it, from Jason Kenney to Peter McKay and a little bit to the left and right of, e of, of each of those. Uh, it would be folly to lose that. But the other thing that the Conservative Party had and lost while Stephen Harper was the leader was that it was comfortable to explaining to other people what it was up, up to and what it was for. When I wrote a book about Mr. Harper, I found long, detailed, speeches about ideas that he had given before he became conservative leader, and then none after he became the conservative leader. And the more, the longer that went on, uh, the more I wondered what the hell. Uh, the construction of hegemony, the constant uh, explaining uh, to the people why you deserve to govern is not something you can replace with uh, snotty brat kids in t-shirts who push uh, reporters off the section of the carpet that they're not supposed to be on. That's not the same thing. And uh, I, I hope you all uh, bear that in mind as you go forward. Thanks. Okay, so what, uh, what we're going to do now is uh, have a, a lively question and answer period. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of questions just to give you time to get to the microphone. So there's a, uh, four microphones there. If you, if you have a question, uh, we'll sort of go back and forth and you can identify who on the panel you'd like to, to answer them. Um, just while you're, you're lining up at the mics, uh, what I am asking for is questions. Uh, if you have a speech that you want to give, uh, there will be a leadership race for the party uh, coming up, and you're welcome to join that. But we're just hoping to get some, some questions here. So in, uh, I'll maybe start off. Um, you know, there was a theme that ran throughout a lot of your comments talking about the importance of communications, which kind of rings true to me because nobody ever came uh, into a meeting after an event went south and ever said, you know what, we needed more research. It was always a problem with communications. We didn't communicate it. We needed better messages. Nobody ever, ever blamed research. Um, but you know, there, that was a theme, the need for storytelling, the need for messages. Anthony, you said uh, the need to smile a bit more. We actually identified that for Stephen Harper and put smile more in his scripts. But then we found out that it was actually scaring small children. <laughs> so we, we took that out. But I guess what I'm interested in is, so is it a, is it a, when we talk about the need to recharge uh, the right or recharge the conservative, conservative movement, um, is, it, is it simply a matter of, of style? Um, is it a matter of substance that we have to look at? Or is there a structural um, problem that the party uh, needs to address? So maybe 
Maybe I'll start with Paul this time and work my way down. Um, I, I think style has a lot to do with it, um, but I also think that uh, any party that wins, including the Trudeau Liberals recently, has to occupy a part of the political spectrum that is denied to the other parties or that the other parties deny themselves. Uh, you, I mean, you, need, you need a base. You need, you need a reason for people to vote for you. Uh, and that's why I think the Conservative Party needs to be pretty conservative. Uh, and, um, uh, but from that base, you need to talk to all Canadians. You need to actually have an answer on all the issues that a government will, c can address. Um, but uh, I spoke to Bruce Carson for my book, uh, not about most of the stuff people would want to talk to, ask Bruce Carson about, but, uh, and he, he said that uh, the amount of preparation they, they put in between the 2004 election, which they lost, and the 2006 election, which they won, just the huge amount of pre preparation they put into platform development, caucus committees, uh, multiple drafts, uh, people who hadn't been working on this chapter of the platform would say, well, what about this, what about that, and the, and, and the committee would have to go back to the drawing board. And that wasn't communication particularly, but it was, um, it produced answers on questions like transport, road development, uh, uh, borders, uh, and on and on, that um, were awful handy when, you were, when, they, when later they started looking for something to communicate. I don't think these are, I don't think these are an entirely uh, only matters of style. And I've seen way too many people think they could get far with nothing but style. And then, like Michael Ignati, if in the end it turns out they didn't even have much style. You know, Chantel? Um, I'm not going to say that uh, it's a style issue, uh, not a substance issue. I would mildly disagree with Paul uh, on the notion that uh, you need to work on occupying policy ground that other parties deny themselves. I think you've done too good a job at that. And in the end, it's not only policy ground that others won't occupy, but it builds a fence between you and uh, a lot of voters. I think you need to rethink what conservatism is in a 21st century Canada. I, I don't think uh, not having an environment policy beyond uh, the economy comes first is an acceptable policy for a serious party, and I don't think having an environment policy is the sign of a progressive party. It's just the sign of a modern party. I think you've got ledgers of, of uh, modern reality that you have conveniently uh, set aside, saying, well, you know, I, I don't want to go there. So the work-life balance issue is, is a good one. We are not going to go back to the day when one parent was at home and one was earning a living. It's just not going to happen. People who go to Tim Hortons don't dream of that for their daughters. Uh, aspirational policies are not the purview of progressive parties. Or if you think they are, why would you be spending the weekend here uh, if you didn't aspire to, to a different vision? And conveniently, at every step of the way, these issues have been put under the label, this is progressive. So we are good because we are against this. I'll take a, a, a stupid example. It's okay to believe that the monarchy is important and that it should have more of a place in the public space of Canada. But it is possible to actually, uh, like the monarchy, like the Charter of Rights and Freedom, and like Medicare. Most Canadians actually are of that persuasion. This either of or uh, everything we had before uh, 1970 was great, and everything that happened after that we want to deny. It no more works than the Parti Québécois efforts to turn the clock back uh, on a Quebec purelaine Quebec and believe that younger Ke Quebecers are going to be attracted to their cause uh, because they're going to bring them around to those old ancient values. You need to come to mainstream Canadians, that doesn't mean going to the center, but it does mean engaging on issues that are important to a uh, uh, hell of a lot of voters. Anthony. And I wanna, I wanna pick up on something Paul said in his opening remarks, where he said, 
like 10, 15 or longer years ago, Stephen Harper would give these policy lectures where he'd deeply explain exactly why he was doing what he did and why it mattered. And, and I don't want my opening remarks to be mistaken for, okay, now you gotta be a bit more left wing. I mean, if anything, keep being conservative, or as Paul said, be, be even more conservative and explain it better and sell it better. Because I think there's, there are so many times when, when, there are, when there are conservative politicians who want to be sneaky about being conservative. I, I'm not really cutting this program. It's, I'm really doing a pretty centrist thing out there. Don't, don't worry. It's, now I'm going to trick you into thinking it's not conservative. You know what? If you think the policy or the, if you think the program should be cut, if you think the funding should be canceled, and you firmly believe that, you probably have a good argument for it. And if you go out there and you sell it with conviction and you're standing at the podium at the scrum until the questions run out and you take on all comers and you explain why, to my previous point, you think this is a good thing for the country, I think you'll prevail rather than doing what I call, and it was definitely under the Harper government, but I think uh, Tim Hudak tried to do it. And I think there's a chance we're seeing Patrick Brown might do it, what I call sneaky conservatism. No, 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 we're still in a liberal sensibility. No, 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 just bring people over to your side and explain why your position is right. You don't need to gloss it up as sort of faux liberalism because Kathleen Wynne is a whole hell of a lot better at being Kathleen Wynne than you are. <laughs> well, that I can agree with, yes. Mercedes. I would say that I think it's style and it's substance. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, we didn't get to ask a lot of questions to Stephen Harper when he was the prime minister. But there was a couple of occasions where we actually got a, a background briefing and then were able to ask questions and, and one of them would have been uh, to do with Chinese companies buying into the oil sands. And Stephen Harper came in and he answered a lot of questions. And I remember thinking, wow, he really knows this file. He's got, uh, th this is not superficial, he's giving us political talking points. He understands what the issues here are. He knows where the pitfalls are. He's accepting that, he's moving forward. And I think if you look at the coverage that came out of that, it was pretty good. Uh, and I don't mean necessarily positive that people were writing this with a positive spin, but it was comprehensive. People understood what they were talking about. They felt the questions had been answered. There wasn't a sense that uh, people were hiding behind something, that there was something they didn't want to tell us. Let's dig until we find out what it is, uh, which let me tell you is every reporter's first instinct. If you give uh, a surface level line that's not real communication of who you are and what you're about is, what are they hiding? There's something here. I'm going to dig until I find it. Sometimes there's nothing, but that's the instinct. Um, and the, the narrowing as well of participation in ideas. Um, and, and this goes to what I think so many of my colleagues have said on the panel, that uh, to have a party that is more broad and accepting of all different kinds of conservatism and not determining that only certain people are allowed to make decisions or have input and anybody who doesn't is a pariah or a traitor and is taken out of that decision making process uh, where you end up having people who are all reinforcing each other's sometimes bad ideas uh, and sometimes great ideas but to not have that challenge function because that somehow represents a threat instead of an opportunity to grow uh, is something that I think the, the movement has to rethink. Okay, well I see, um, always time for a pause. Um, I see people lined up at the mic, so maybe instead of me asking some questions, I'll throw it, throw it to you because they're probably gonna be more insightful. So uh, I'll start to my, to my right and we'll, we'll go back and forth. And I'm learning communication skills enough that I can speak in a room with so many people. Ooh, Mac. <laughs> but most universities are liberal. Where, do you have a tip or two how conservatives or where conservatives can learn to communicate clearly, effectively, with style, and maybe a bit of humor? One or two tips on where we can learn to communicate. Uh, and my question is for Mercedes. Sure. Well, I, I should tell you, first of all, I came from University of Calgary. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. um, and, and I don't have a journalism degree, I have a political science degree, but uh, my, my sense is just be, be human. Be who you are, communicate naturally. We're not asking you to tell us all your secrets. Have a conversation with people. What Chantal was saying about um, the, the banter and talking back and forth and actually getting to know people, to, to think about from the larger perspective of your movement, what are we really about? If you're talking to your mom at home and she's totally apolitical, how do you explain what you're about? 
Why is this something you believe in? Why is it something you think is important? And explain. Be willing to explain the arguments behind it. Be willing to give the facts. Be willing to stand up to the, the criticism you may have on that in a way that isn't, again, seeing it as a threat, uh, but sees it as an opportunity to explain and take on those arguments and strengthen your own. So from, from my perspective as a journalist, if you want to communicate with me, just call me up and say, do you want to go for a coffee? Sure, happy to, right? I don't need you to tell me anything. Sometimes we'll talk about nothing. That first coffee, we'll just be getting to know each other. Where are you from? What do you do? Um, and to, to have that uh, and to think about who you want to be and to get those messages out, not to focus so much on what's the message, what's the soundbite. That's part of it because you have to get into the media cycle. But that will come more naturally once you start to establish a comfort level with communicating at all. Yeah, it, it really isn't that difficult. I mean, look at me. I'm, <laughs> I'm getting paid now for what I used to get detentions for in high school, so <laughs> I think everybody can do it. Um, maybe I'll go to over here for another question. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Anne Marie, and I'm uh, with the uh, Carleton School of Political Management. Um, my question is for anyone who would like to uh, answer this. Uh, in general, I'm hearing a lot of uh, um, top, uh, I guess, um, ideas around tone, uh, personality, that kind of this kind of thing. To me, politics is inspirational. When I, when I see a leader, I want to be inspired to um, to, to follow what they what they are talking about. So uh, I know that tone is important, personality is important. What, what do you think is important for people to be inspired by a leader? I don't think that uh, leaders come uh, in, in a serial box and there's the, the top grade and then there's the, the, the bottom shelf one. I think to go back to points that were made earlier, it's anybody who is a leader can inspire if it comes across that they are true to themselves mm -hmm. and their ideas. Authenticity sells a lot better than any polished uh, lesson you could pick up uh, in a speaking school. And people see through you if you are not authentic. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, look at the people who have been leaders in this country, provincially and federally. We have a real wide range. But what they have in common, the successful ones, is that they came across as authentic. And sometimes they actually worked on that. You don't, you can sound like you're saying everything you're thinking with knowing in your head that there, where the line is. But uh, being authentic is more important than uh, being charismatic, I think. Uh, one of my lines is that charisma lasts a, a, a couple weeks in Canadian politics. Um, uh, and I like that Chantal mentioned provincial leaders. If you look at the last several Ontario premiers to get reelected, uh, Kathleen Wynne, Dalton McGuinty, Mike Harris, uh, um, each of whom was enraged their political opponents, uh, each of whom uh, was able to build a, law, a broad movement of Ontarians who were happy to get behind them because, you know, to their to their audience, they they felt like they meant what they were saying and that they were. Um, that they were in it for a reason besides personal advancement, you know. Which, and I say this with affection, in Mr. McGinty's case, was a hell of a trick. Um, uh, uh, and if you look at if you look at all the thirty or so people who've been running for the U.S. president this year, it it's not obvious. It would not have been obvious to me six months ago that Bernie Saunders would have been one of the ones to rise. Uh, so if you go for a kind of a surface conception of glamour, you just almost always wind up with a dud. If you go with, if you, and if you and if you seek a leader that you don't believe, but you're pretty sure you can sell them to other Canadians, you will lose every time. You got to find a leader that you want to have as your prime minister, for starters. That that's no guarantee, but you're doomed if you don't do that. Kim Campbell comes to mind. Yeah. Mm. Chosen for the wrong reasons, not, uh, and I'm not. This is not a judgment on her, but a judgment on the party that picked her, because she was going to be so different from Brian Mulroney. And you know, you have this debate over why women aren't voting for Hillary Clinton and shouldn't they be. We had this debate here uh, in, in 1993. But the conservatives who selected her uh, clearly didn't select her for what they saw as her strengths, but rather for the marketing uh, of that leader. Great. OK, another question from the right-hand side. So I have to admit, I'm 
somewhat paranoid about journalists, and <laughs> <laughs> even paranoids have enemies, you know. Well, the, and that, that was my that was going to be my point. Trust um, your sensibilities. <laughs> <laughs> but I became less paranoid about journalists. Um, I I and a couple of my friends organized something called the Fabulous Blue Tent. And we invited a lot of journalists, and a lot of people came, and I saw them as much more friendly and human than, than before. And I'm, I'm wondering, maybe we need to have more parties. As, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, if and, that's an and offer of free alcohol, yeah. I accept. <laughs> well, you're all, we're going to have another one in, in Vancouver, so you're all welcome to come. But you know, um, should we socialize more? I mean, I know uh, Mr. Cameron in, in Britain had a, 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 a program to try and uh, schmooze the BBC journalists. I mean, is that what we need to do? <coughs> well, to Mercedes' point about just, hey, call me up and we'll go for coffee and maybe in the first meeting uh, nothing will happen, I think at least the advantage and what builds upon that is then you've made that relationship. So when you send the email saying, hey, Anthony, hey, Mercedes, I, I found out this news or there's this report you should look at, you're not going, you know, who's this crazy guy from the bunker getting in touch with me? You go, oh, it's him. Yeah, you know, I, I appreciate that guy's sensibilities. I, I, you know, I'm gonna look into what he's talking about. I trust it. So, yeah, relationship building, totally. Yeah. Oh, the mic over there. Yeah, I've got a question. We're talking about bringing all conservatives together and the different types of conservatives in the movement, bringing them into the party. But I think there's a real disconnect between uh, older conservatives and younger conservatives. I mean, I see it all the time. I know a lot of young conservatives who think uh, very differently than the conservatives that are, you know, a generation. Uh, ago, back in the Reform Party, for example. So how do you bridge that gap? Because of course, there are a lot of older conservatives that are very wise, been in this game, know what they're talking about, but looking towards the youth and, and getting the youth engaged, um, having youth here that are, there's so many of them here, um, uniting them, bringing them together, and having a collated, like some, some sort of message that we can sell uh, to all Canadians, because there is that big, big divide, and it's, it's hard sometimes. I mean, a lot of people don't take the youth seriously. They say, you, young whippersnappers, uh, you don't know what you're talking about, but no, I mean, we are the future, so how do you bridge that gap? And that goes for really any one of you there. Except uh, the moderator. <laughs> I would say, actually, Jim, you would have a lot of, <laughs> you would have a lot of insights. I'm looking forward to your memoirs. Um, it would be a coloring book, actually. Maybe a, a scratch and sniff, Paul. That would be my, uh, my yeah. I would say never stop, never stop talking to one another. Uh, and, uh, and, and be tolerant of differences of opinion within the movement as a good first step to going out and, and showing to the rest of the country that you're as good at that or better at that than, than, than the other political movements. Um, uh, one thing I do want to say is that there are in the Canadian Conservative movement a small number of people uh, who, who have, have, have completely lost the difference between being willing to, willing to fight for your beliefs, being, being willing to stand up for your beliefs, and a compelling inability to ever stop fighting. Um, uh, a good rule of thumb is that if I've blocked you on Twitter, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> uh, and I think, I, I think we know who of I speak. People who used to cover this event and are now have decided that the entire event is beyond the pale of Canadian conservatism are the problem. But, <laughs> but, maybe, but maybe, Paul, I can, I can maybe take a crack at it just because, you know, when I was involved in, in the Reform Party back in, you know, 94, um, it really was a party of equals, right? There was no real hierarchy, we, not, even, not, not even the leader, right? There was a, it was a party of equals. So um, we were fairly young, we were brought in. Um, we actually did work that we would never in a million years have been asked to do in any other party, right? We weren't licking stamps, we weren't making phone calls, we were actually writing policy. We were, you know, putting together the election platform. We were doing all of this, right? And I think we need to get back to that. That yes, it's great to have former cabinet ministers, to have really important people, to have, have uh, big money and the, the, the brothers and the sisters and the, and the daughters and the sons of big money, but you know, that really can't um, become the, the party. We have to get back to being a party of, of equals where everybody can take a crack at the policy. You don't have to necessarily be the expert. Here and just the lesson. So <laughs> maybe, um, over to the other side. Well, I want to thank you on the panel for this really authentic discussion and of course Preston for bringing us all together. Um, I'm hearing two themes and Chantel, you said 
uh, uh, we need to have intelligent policies that respond to people's needs. And I'm certainly drawn to that. But uh, I'm John West, and I, I was the MP for West Vancouver, Sunshine Coast Sea to Sky Country for two terms, and uh, contested unsuccessfully in the last election. At a thousand doors, I never heard somebody say our platforms were inadequate or deficient. Instead, I heard more of the theme that you also brought out and others, not what we're doing, but who we are. And, and the reason I joined the Conservative Party is because I thought it shared the values that I cared most about, freedom, responsibility, equality, compassion, integrity. And, and I love to think and, and be those things. And I didn't hear people saying we stood for that. And so um, my question is this, where do you see the emphasis? What we do in terms of our platforms, which is important, or who we are and who we are perceived to be and, and the values that we stand for? But they come in hand, right? Uh, I'll bring you to the kneecap debate. Why did Justin Trudeau win the kneecap debate on an issue that he should have lost in the polls? Because his stance on the kneecap debate, which is a policy stance, goes to who the liberals are. Uh, you could set your clock on Justin Trudeau saying what he said about the kneecap, because that's who they are. You, you can like it or not like it, but you do know that. I look at your party and the NICAB, and I don't know who you think you are. If you do, you can explain it to me. But when people look at you and say it's, it's who you are or who you are not, they may not be rhyming off policy positions, but in their minds, there are issues that brand a party beyond tone. Uh, and before you set out, you need to decide for yourselves who you are. I have to say that having covered with great interest the Reform Party, the Canadian Alliance, the Brian Mulroney government, I don't really know who you are anymore, uh, except, it seems, uh, to go to the point from the young person, a party that seems to believe that it's the party of a status quo. And I don't think that's where you come from. Okay, I'm very conscious of this countdown clock here, um, and I'm afraid of what's going to happen when it goes to the red. So we've got about um, six minutes left, and I'd like to get through, uh, through the questions from the floor. So I'll ask you to be quick with the questions, and Pam, if you could be quick with the answers too. Certainly. So uh, my name is Tim Barnes. I'm a student at Mount Royal University in Computer Information Systems. Uh, first off, thank everyone for uh, coming out here today. It's a great conversation and one we need to have. Um, also, I wanted to thank you for your broad support for the Rebel in their controversy with Rachel Notley in, over in Alberta. My question is, uh, looking at U.S. campuses, uh, the controversies with Ben Shapiro and Milo Yiannopoulos, the people trying to shut down intelligent discussion and uh, legitimate debate, uh, as journalists, uh, the right to free speech and the right to the freedom of the press are cornerstones of any democracy. Can you speak to the importance and perhaps, uh, perhaps comment a little bit on this movement to try and shut down these commentators? You, you need to say something, especially about free speech. This is true. That's just some advice from the communications guy. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the instances you bring up, and, and obviously, you know, what's, what's hate speech? It's speech we hate. So then you, of course, want to shut down anyone who doesn't have the view that you have, and it's unfortunate, and it shouldn't be happening. One thing, though, that I think has been bad for society in the past 10 years, and I apologize, this isn't to exactly answer your question, but sort of both the blogosphere and campus shenanigans have played a greater part in influencing how average people view the news, because it's this uh, disproportionate uh, vocal minority, and it's easy to write those stories, get them out there, and they get a, a disproportionate amount of social media traction. That, that, you know, the whole question of, you know, should this guy who's running these, these I'm talking about this uh, Roosh V guy who does the, I'm trying to think of what, it, what it's called, the how to, is sort of misogynist, pseudo misogynist event. You know, we just shouldn't all be talking about this as a country. It's a really sort of fringe little thing, but battle lines are drawn by that. And then you're defined by, do you, do you, do, do you agree with the extreme left or do you agree with sort of this extreme other version? And it's not particularly healthy. So. Uh, obviously, these folks should not be 
be, be censored at all. And they're actually saying relatively benign stuff that people just can't handle anyone who doesn't completely agree with them. But I, I just think it's a shame that campus rhetoric has become uh, national rhetoric. A question over here. Yes, hello, I'm a uh, green conservative and I'm, I take very well the suggestions that we have had here about uh, owning up to the fact that we are conservatives and, that, and, 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 and really uh, being proud of you know, our, our values. <coughs> One question I have, though, is for the conservative movement to recharge, uh, do we also not need to distance ourselves in certain areas, specifically issues such as climate, which aren't going to go away? Oh, no, yes, this is your... Rock, paper, scissors, go. Um, I, I missed the last, last part of your question. I think I got it, but I'm not sure, so I, can you just repeat it so okay, I don't... So do, for the movement to recharge, do we, uh, in some areas, need to distance ourselves from our past policies and, and uh, attitudes? My answer to that uh, would be, of course, uh, I, and actually you've, ta you've used up a decade uh, distancing yourself from an issue that is not going to go away to the point that when you introduced yourself as a green conservative, there should not be green conservatives because the conservatives should be green. Uh, and until that happens uh, and you speak to a minority called Green Conservatives, I think that this party will have a problem. Question. Uh, my name is Lynn Golding, and I'm the uh, wife of an MP. I knocked on uh, hundreds of doors during this campaign. Um, at the beginning of the campaign, the reaction um, about our leader, uh, the Prime Minister, was that he was somebody that a lot of people didn't want to have a beer with, um, but they thought he was very competent and was the best person to lead the economy. By the end of the campaign, really by the middle of the campaign, nobody was talking about anything like that. They were just saying, you know, love your husband, can't stand his leader. So that's what we heard at door after door. So um, I'm wondering whether you wrote articles like that. What turned, this turned on a dime, in, in my um, opinion, with rank and file voters who um, aren't aligned with the party. It really turned on a dime. So, and it was before the kneecap issue. The kneecap issue was the nail in the coffin. So I'm just wondering if you, detected that if you wrote on that and what you think caused that change in about uh, mid-September. There as was not a poll for two years that didn't show 66% of Canadians committed to voting for someone else. So there was not a great love affair out there for Stephen Harper. I think what happened mid-September is that Canadians decided that Justin Trudeau was acceptable. Uh, but. I look at the polls, it's two years of polls where people say, isn't it great how sturdy the conservative base is rather than, isn't it bad that they never rise over and above that base? Uh, so there was not a solid foundation for re-election. It rested on a good split between the NDP and the Liberals, didn't happen, and it rested on Justin Trudeau not being up for the job. Those are two conditions outside of your control. Uh, but they are not great conditions to go in a campaign with. I've, I've spoken to quite senior people, uh, very loyal to Stephen Harper in the Conservative campaign, who say they were seeing, they were hearing what you started to hear as early as the beginning of 2015. Uh, whether they were committed conservative, committed not conservative, or undecided, the question that they would hear at the door in by-election campaigns and things like that was, so when are you going to change the leader? You know. Um, by the end of it, and by the end of it means that the, in, the entire duration of the campaign, the Harper conservative campaign had sunk well into self-parody. To the extent that I do these, these insidery, super unnamed sources, pieces after the election about how it all went down, I would, again, talk to people who had senior supervisory positions in the conservative campaign who did not know much at all about what had happened in the office on, on this side and the office on that side in the campaign. It's great if you have a secrecy policy that, 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 that means you, no one's supposed to talk to me. But first of all, that doesn't work. They do talk to me. Secondly, apparently they didn't talk to each other, and they lost bad. Don't do that. <laughs> okay, so we have, we have limited time, and I see uh, two people. So maybe what I'll do is get you to ask your question quickly. I'll get you to ask your question quickly, and then we'll, we'll mash together an answer. Okay, prior to the election, we had uh, several high-profile uh, conservatives uh, retire from the party to private business. How hurtful was that to the party? Okay, and a question there. Uh, 
sorry. So uh, sneaky conservatism was mentioned here and how conservatives sometimes try to find uh, workaround ways of doing something instead of arguing their point. So how can this be not only the right thing to do, but also a winning strategy? So how does one argue the message that is unpopular? Because sometimes journalists just wait for the right moment or they like to cover what's popular. So I think it's also tempting for politicians to do, to focus on what sells best. So how can arguing your point be a winning strategy? Thank I you. think conviction politicians whether they're Barack Obama or Rob Ford, win, because people smell their conviction. I think doing what's right uh, is self-explanatory, and if it's not, then it's not what's right. I like the question over here, and I've forgotten. What was it? It was about, well, it was about, <laughs> it was about sneaky conservatives as well, but those high-profile uh, cabinet ministers yeah. and politicians leaving. Yeah, James and, 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 uh, and Peter and, and, and the gang, uh, John Baird. I heard several months before he left that he was going to leave. Um, it was, uh, it, it seriously sapped the momentum out of the movement, but you can't blame people for making their individual decisions. And somebody in their late 40s, mid 40s will stay in politics if politics looks good, you know. Uh. What you can blame a campaign trust for is knowing all this, not to go out of its way to rebuild a, a fresher team. And Jean Chrétien, for all of his bragging about himself, went into the 2000 election having made sure that he had new solid faces around him, that he wasn't just selling himself as, I'm here, what do you care if everybody else has left? Uh, and you know, the evidence would suggest that the longer you're around, the more you need to show uh, your capacity to renew, and the less you should count on just being the leader. Uh, and this conservative campaign went the other way. They'd also put in the front window of the government for months on end, uh, people that I would argue were more likely to score cheap points in question period than to impress Canadians with the worthiness of the conservative te uh, team. And to make matters worse, it's not as if those people did not exist. They were just not put forward. So I was told, you know, when we're getting down to the countdown to go stand here, that that was gonna be a sign so um, I, on, on your behalf, I'd just like to thank our, our panelists this morning. The, the journalist panel is, is always, I think, one of the highlights of the, of the Manning Conference. So if we could have a round of applause for our journalists. <laughs>